Juan Barker. Joe, are you there? Jeff Sherman? All right, we'll catch back up with you guys later. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, let's see, SDK, no, okay. Community time, are there any community related topics people would like to bring up? Things that aren't on the normal agenda. All right, not hearing any, moving forward. All right, SDK work. Um, <clears throat> actually, we had a meeting right before this one, and uh, there are two things that popped up that I think are worthy of mentioning here. One is we started the discussion of having some sort of SDK event thingy at, at KubeCon EU, whether it's a demo, some sort of interop event, not quite sure yet, it's still sort of in its infancy. But I just wanted to bring it to your guys' attention that we are going to be starting some discussions on the SDK Slack channel about what we want to do there. So if you guys have an SDK or if you're involved in one of the SDKs, um, please keep an eye out for that because um, we don't want someone to, to miss out an opportunity to participate in that. Um, and then related to that was the, the whole discussion mainly driven by the work that's going on in the Go SDK around versioning in particular. Uh, what version of the spec should people support going forward? So for example, the Go SDK is currently trying to support all three versions of the spec and also trying to uh, keep up with master as it goes along. Um, so we're gonna start having discussions on the SDK Slack channel about what are, the, uh, what are the expectations from the other SDKs as well. And obviously that's probably gonna be very much related to what we choose to do at KubeCon EU around this event. So just FYI for these discussions that are gonna happen on the SDK Slack channel. Um, Mark or Scott, is there anything else you guys wanted to add to that that I may have forgotten? Okay. No, I think that's good. Okay, not hearing any. Um, moving forward then, um, demo proposal. Scott, would you like to bring the team up to speed on what's going on there? Yeah, so uh, the, the other Doug, uh, I forget his. It starts with an M. That's all I can remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's there's interest in uh, this real world example. Uh, in, in general, it's a, some sort of pipeline where there's producers, and then there's like some sort of inner uh, routing piece, and then there's consumers of events. And my original demo proposal was the simulation of an e-commerce pipeline, and then uh, Doug brought up there's this partnership that he's been working with and uh, through other working groups doing uh, an example, uh, what, what is it called? A smart city for an airport. So potentially the demo could migrate to be same sort of situation where there's event producers and consumers, but the focus is around how an airport views itself and maybe can react to, to events that are happening you could still get that same e-commerce pipeline because there's merchants and uh, shipments and other uh, people buying stuff in an airport. And then the, the, the thing could grow to simulate what an airport uh, is eventing at any given time. And then uh, I think the overall goal is that each consumer and producer can, can use the events to do something interesting. And the airport itself could actually view all of its uh, components as, and then make some sort of determination about the health of the airport. And so that would be like the long term, uh, if you continue working on the demo, this is what it does. And so each vendor would like potentially act as a entity inside the airport doing events and consuming things. So uh, if there's, so, I th it, we, we think it's interesting and hopefully everyone else thinks it's interesting enough to participate. And Doug, I noticed you have a microphone out. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think Scott did a great job of explaining it. And I, I, it sounds like you actually may be able to get some real life customers involved in some fashion, like Heathrow Airport and stuff too, which is I'm really, really excited about. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, so um, there's a, an international airport council that, um, it has evolved an information system that extends, you know, from flight systems down to transportation, baggage claim, retail components. It's all under the, they call it ACRIS, A-C-R-I-S. 
A is for airport. And uh, a few, um, I don't know, a dozen uh, prominent international airports have implemented that model. Heathrow being kind of the lead on that. Um, and then in the U.S., I think uh, San Francisco and Orlando are, are behind it. So it's it's gaining momentum. And so I see this as something that would be mutually beneficial um, to, to connect, you know, cloud events to ACRIS. You know, so to cre create awareness of, uh, of both projects. Yep. Sounds really cool. And thank you very much for... Uh for looping us in with that. This is this should be really exciting. All hey, right. Hey Doug. Hey Doug. Yeah, go ahead. This is Austin here. Um yeah, sorry. The, what's the project called? ACRIS? It's yeah, A C R I S. Um Doug Doug um has a link to um a deck that describes the uh, ACRIS um airport ecosystem. Mm -hmm. He could probably get it to you. Yeah, I'll uh have, make a note of us I'll forget. Um Send out okay. presentation. I yeah, I, I just joined. I joined kind of like at, at the very tail end of that. But I um in October last year I did a presentation and uh, partnered with Accenture on this. We did a a full uh, demonstration of an event driven airport. Um everything from what happens when a flight is delayed, uh, orchestrating all actors, elements within the airport, across the airline to the airport itself in an event-driven way using um, our event gateway project. And we spent a lot of work, did a lot of research um, on this, and you know, we had a whole story that we kind of started with just this, this uh, linear sequence of events um, and who would respond and how they'd respond. So we have, we have a whole bunch of materials from that, um, if, any, if it's of interest to anyone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that like sounds good. Really yeah. All right, cool. Thank you guys very much. I'm really excited to see how this thing's going to shape up. And I'm sure it's going to, the time of the, the day, it's going to come up faster than we expect. So we've got to keep moving on it. All right. Uh, Kukan EU. Uh, um, actually, I think we've had a phone call. I don't know when the next phone call is. But anyway, I don't think anything's really much changed there other than I did find out that the Serverless Practitioner Summit um, is still moving forward. I believe they're planning on having a a CFP type of setup, uh, so expect to see some notes about that relatively soon. Um, so I think they're basically looking at it being a basically a mini summit kind of thing with the keynotes and then breakout sessions and stuff like that, and people can submit proposals for talks and stuff. Um, assuming they do that, uh, we probably then need to figure out whether uh, we should have our serverless working group meeting as part of that or still under the tr normal KubeCon thing. <clears throat> I think it might be a little still premature to, to try to make that kind of decision yet since I don't know exactly what the format is for this other summit. But I just thought I'd bring you up to speed that they are still moving forward with that. It's not, um, the silence does not mean that it's gone away. So, all right, um, let's see. Okay, so I did ask for a 35 minute intro and deep dive, two separate ones there for KubeCon uh, China and asked for an 80 minute long session for serverless to match up what we're doing at Coupon EU. Um, just to let you guys know that I did request that. I believe the call for papers is open. So if you guys want to submit papers just in general around any topic at all, whether it's serverless or not, I just I reminded you that the CFP uh, period is open now. And with that, I believe we can start talking about PR. So let me just do a quick last minute check here about one thing. Okay, no more votes. Okay, so Rachel's PR. So last week we started a vote. Let me get to it. <clears throat> oh, did I get Etown? I think I already got Etown. Okay. Yeah, so last week we took a vote on these four choices nothing, just a list of the external specs include the specs, and then include the specs with the TCK. Now, hopefully I did all the voting right. I had to convert the numbers you guys gave me into the format that the tool actually wanted, meaning four columns and with a number in the column representing your preferred choice. So for example, for Google, their first choice was number three, which is the specs. Their second choice was specs with SDK or TCK. And then third choice was just list. So 
Um, look at this list. This is on the attendance doc. If you guys want to take a look at it and verify my, my stuff. But I think it's right. Later on, I will take this and run it through the, the official tool. But I think if you just look at it, you'll see number one does pop up in column number two most often. And I will double check that through the tool, but I think it's pretty obvious that number two, which is just the list, it is going to win. So that will be the step going forward. And I think the next step here is to ask uh, Rachel, who's not on the call yet, to, um, to update her PR based upon that. Does that sound right to everybody in terms of process? Okay. So I will make a note of that in the meeting minutes. Uh, um, All right, cool. Okay, moving forward then. Christoph, how would you like to handle your PR? Do you want to talk about your new proposal first? Do you want to talk about where you're on the old one? How do you want to work that? Yeah, let's talk about the new one first. Okay. So the old one we discussed a couple of times. So basically the main goal is that we have a event, a size of an event, and we know that it will, everyone should accept it. Um, that means if I'm as a event producer, I'm creating an event that is below the size, I am can be certain that everyone that follows me accepts it unless they have really big reasons not to because there are some super constrained edge device. But like in the cloud, let's say everyone should accept it after me. So the proposal I gave last time was that just take the event, serialize it as JSON, even if you don't send it uh, with JSON on the wire. And that was criticized because, yeah, well, if you're not sending JSON over the wire, you have to do one serialization in JSON that's sort of pointless. Um, but I'd like to point out that the good part, or we are requiring everyone to support JSON anyway, so everybody should have this implemented. Um, but after that critique that we maybe shouldn't force a serialization in JSON, um, I tried a different way, or I, here I described a different way how to measure the size of an event independent of any uh, encoding and formatting and so on. So this is what this does. So these are a few more rules. Um, so there's a limit on the number of attributes, um, on the attribute name length. We basically already have that in the attribute uh, spec itself. Um, and then individual limits on uh, binaries, on strings, which are basically those that are unbound. And then the last bullet point is a, uh, well, a size, limitation for all attributes together. And then we can discuss what the individual size would be. But the point here is that we measure that independently of the encoding. So for example, an integer would always be four byte. But if you take an integer and encode it in JSON, it will obviously not be four byte because it's represented differently. And if you take a binary, um, it will also not be exactly that because you have to base 64 encoded. So in JSON, the actual value will be bigger. So we don't really know what the size on the wire will be, um, but still everyone would have to support this. So we can figure out if we still want to kind of want to be for JSON, want to be below 64 kilobytes, then we kind of have to do the math. I think 40 kilobytes should be fair enough. Yeah, so to summarize, in comparison to the proposal I made last time, you don't have to go through the JSON serialization. Um, that's the good part. The other good part is that the limits are much fine granular. And you know, you, we also have then a limit on the number of, of attributes, for example. The downside is that everyone who wants to, well, follow these rules, they have to implement something new. They should already have the JSON serialization implemented. Yep, I'm happy to take questions. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions? So I, I admire your grit with this for one. <laughs> um, um, is there an expectation then that the SDK would have to sort of 
check this stuff and report on i i'm i'm i understand the intent behind it i'm just trying to understand how you would operationalize it if you need to or is it just purely a guidance well i think there will be let's say there will be some event producers who will simply always be below these limits because they only have a few attributes and their data will not be so big so for them it's really a non-concern and then there are others who may want to push it and i think for them it is really good that we have a guidance that explicitly states what is allowed and what is not allowed and the same thing is true for middleware like as a middleware i may or basically every messaging middleware has a limit somewhere um, so i think we should settle on something so that every middleware knows what it has to support at a minimum so i think if i as a middleware now would say okay json until 256 kilobytes i just accept that then you're fine because that's already that will definitely hold uh, anything according to these rules so is there an implication here? So, so you've made a comment that binary should not exceed 1K, yeah? So if I'm sending an event with a binary payload, binary data through HTTP, you're, that would sort of mean in a binary transmission mode, my payload could never be more than 1K. No, the, I excluded the data attribute from that rule. Ah, okay. Yeah. That's me not reading. Okay, excellent. Okay, I'm with you then. Okay, thank you. So the idea is to limit the other attributes is that as a middleware, you want to parse all them or at least potentially parse and look at them. So if you limit it, we also, basically what all HTTP servers do, they limit the size of the headers. So this is sort of similar so that as a middleware, you kind of have a stopping ground of how much stuff you have to process. And, and just to uh, give more evidence to the fact that I haven't read this entirely, um, mm -hmm. wh where is the payload size encapsulated in this? And the last bullet point includes the data attribute. So basically, if you have no, well, you will have a few other mandatory attributes, but if they're really small, then you can have a larger data attribute. But if you put more stuff into the other attributes, you will have less size for your data. Okay, we can also, yeah. uh, and that's in its encoded form or it's unencoded form? So, um, well, that's for basically unencoded. I think for the string, we have to use some encoding. So this is UTF-8 and for the binary, there is no encoding. Then if you go to JSON, you have to base64 encode your binary. Right. So that means in JSON, it will be larger than it is as it measured here. Okay. Again, thank you for banging away on this one. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yes, you've had a lot of patience. All right, any other questions or comments for Christoph? Nothing, interesting. Okay, so let me ask one then. Um, so this is not my area of expertise in the slightest, so let me ask this question, because I definitely understand the desire for some sort of minimum size. I can, I can understand that and from an overall perspective. But relative to spelling out individual things like, you know, in, what, with the size of each individual property, how often is that a concern in people's experience relative, versus the entire size being a problem? So I think there were comments made before that you, because you, theoretically you could jam your entire event into context attributes, you, you had to sort of take those into account. You, know, you couldn't just rely on the, on the data construct. Yeah, but I guess I'm kind of wondering, right? Obviously people are concerned about the size issue for a reason. And I'm trying to figure out where those size limitations come into play in practice. Is it because the transport can only handle 64K, or is it because the processing engine of these, of these payloads only supports things like, you know, attribute names that are only uh, 20 characters max, right? 
I'm trying to figure out where people's experiences are in this space because I just don't have it. That's why I'm curious. I believe it was an interop issue. Yeah, so, you know, if a I know if someone from AWS is on the line, but if AWS can support 300K events, but um, Azure can only do 64, then there's an immediate impedance mismatch there. So I, I think it was... I think it was just to get at the lowest common denominator. Christoph, I, it, it, was that where this all originated from? Basically, yes. So I think for me, the, the point is that I, I'm an event producer. I produce events and at some point, right, someone can decide to send them to an AWS service, a Azure service, whatever. And my events should go through all of these services. But for that, as an event producer, I kind of have to anticipate what the size limitations of each service will be. And the only place I can look for guidance on that is the spec, I think. So yes, that is exactly the concern. If someone is currently on an AWS service and then which supports like 256K and then they switch over to Azure, which only has 64K, um, then the interop and I'm sending larger events and then sort of we don't have interop because I cannot simply switch out one for the other. Okay, Mark, were you gonna say something? Oh, I, I'll, I'll just say that I think the maximum size is the most important part of this. But again, we want to, uh, in, we, we want to encourage people to put the true event data into the data portion, not into the envelope side. Uh, so adding some of these limits there to as best practices, I think will help enforce that. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to comment on this one? So, okay. So what do you guys want to do relative to moving forward here? I, I, I guess the first step is I'd like to get a sense from the group because I don't know how to interpret silence. Is it silence is you guys don't know, don't have an opinion, like this one as opposed to the other one? I vote for more this one than the other one. Okay, thank you, Jen, for speaking up. I appreciate that. Anybody else care to voice an opinion? I think I have a slight preference for not having to serialize JSON to make sure the size. Okay, thank you, Evan. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, so I also don't like having to serialize the JSON, but I also don't quite like how complicated this got and how much it limits individual fields instead of the total event size. I, I, I still haven't quite thought through this, but my, um, my posi position is quite the same as Clemens's, which is a, it's a shame he isn't here, but the fact that you you want to you want to measure a normal normative uh, version of the event, it, it would help producers, but I don't. But I I don't think how much it will actually help in practice because you if you have an event that is the correct size according to these rules, can, is there still with encodings and different um, formats, the chance that it still doesn't fit into the Azure, what is it, message queue? Event grid. Event grid. Because you're not measuring the size on the wire, you're measuring an intermediary format. Right. So so it, it, if the problem is events fitting onto specific transports, I don't understand how measuring a normative format that doesn't actually measure the end size helps. Okay, so the next step for me is once we've settled on something, I would basically prepare a TCK or whatever you want to call it with a couple of events that really test out these limits. So then there would be like five or 10 events and then these become a TCK and then we can really test that or people can test their consumers that they actually accept those events that really are at the limitations of that. 
And now we can take those, run it against Azure Event Grid, and then we see if it supports it or not, basically. And everybody else who implements something can do the same for their thing. Right. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, st I still don't, I'm still 50 50 on the basic idea, but that makes sense here. Yeah. Right. Anybody else care to speak up? Hi, this is Vladimir. Uh, I have one question uh, regarding the limit for the indexes of maps of 20 characters. Um, I, I feel the number sounds reasonable, I think, for most applications, but uh, I think we may find applications that would like to uh, have the index that is um, dependent on the particular application use, and uh, this thing could be machinely generated and it could possibly be longer. Uh, I'm just concerned that uh, we may get in the same situation like in the old days where the limit for identifiers was eight, which sounded plenty in the Fortran days, uh, but uh, as the time progresses, everybody suffers from that. Yeah, I've, we uh, passed this one PR from Clemens that basically limited the, or is it should, which attribute names should be 20 characters long max. I wasn't a big fan of that. <laughs> what I took this number into account here. Be, um, why, do, why do I want to limit the name length here? Because if they become much longer, then the whole computation for the overall size becomes more complicated. Because if, if they can be like thousands of characters long, then I also have to measure the attribute name length. I can also do that if that's preferred. I see, thanks. And, and basically all these values are up for discussion. If you think it should be something else, I made them more or less up, but they're up for discussion. Okay, anybody else wanna ask a question or voice an opinion? Okay, so in terms of process, I think um, because this one just came in maybe over the last day or so, I think we may, um, need to let it sit there, let people think about it some more, comment on it. And then, Christoph, I think on next week's call, um, it might be your, I don't know whether you want to call it your choice or your responsibility, one of the two, to decide which one you'd like to put forward for the group to consider, if you want to do either one. It's obviously, you're, you could choose to close both of them if you want. Um, but at some point, I think, since they're both your PRs, um, you should probably decide the next step forward in terms of what you want the group to decide yes or no on. Does that sound fair? All right. Then I'll ask everyone to leave comments. And if there basically are no comments, then I think we're good for a vote next time. Okay. And then if the group prefers this one is what I gathered today, then let's go with this one. Wait, one quick question. Mm -hmm. um, what about batch processing? Boy. What about it? Does does the the batched version or the batched events uh, does it count towards the total or do I get like if I batch up five do I get five x the total limit? You get five x the total limit because like the batch just takes the individual events and batches them together. But so it yeah. comes in as one single payload, and so if I think you run into the same problem if that transport can't support uh, some certain size the the thing won't fit anymore yeah but batches are transport defined are they not so that transport probably wouldn't support batching anyway or it may like looking at the azure documentation their limit is per event but you can submit up to 512 events at the same time hmm. okay thank you there you go um, so that, that raises an interesting question in my mind anyway. Is it clear from the text here that all these rules apply to an individual event? I think it does because it says right here, except events as opposed to transport thingy, whatever you want to call it, transport payload. Is it clear that this is just about individual events and that this answer to Scott's question should, should already be in the text or do we need to add additional text here to make it perfectly clear? 
Okay, I'm not hearing anybody speak up, so I guess it's okay the way it is. Okay, so hopefully people, please relate, leave comments on there. Um, not hearing anything else, this may be the one put forward next week for people to say yes or no on, so be prepared for that. If you don't like it, add comments. All right, thank you, Christoph, very much for your patience, as Jim said. Um, all right, did you... Uh, no, we can, I didn't have time to work on it this week, so... Okay, I'll skip that one then. Okay, excellent. Uh, let's see, Clement is not here. Um, so I don't. I think we talked about this one last time, the data encoding thing, but I don't think we made any progress. I think he may need to go back and address comments on that. But since he's not here, we can't talk about it. However, these next two, I don't want to talk about them per se since he's not here. However, I do want to draw people's attention to them. Um, the first one is just an adding an architectural section to the primer. It's uh, because the primer is non-normative, it doesn't technically impact the spec, but it does give insight into what people are thinking about how they should use the spec or what our design decisions were. Uh, so please take a look at that when you get a chance. Um, I want to make sure that it accurately represents the consensus of the group. Uh, likewise, with the SDK object model PR that he opened up, um, this is going to be making changes to a document in our, in our repo itself. There's a SDK.nd file, I believe. Um, he, in this document, put together some pretty strong recommendations for what SDK should and should not do relative to how things get exposed to the user and stuff like that. And I really think the SDK authors need to take a look at that to make sure they're okay with it. Um, uh, on the surface, some of them sound re reasonable, but at the, if you think about it, it actually does put quite a big requirement on implementation details. So I think people need to take a very close look at that. So please look at those two when you get a chance. Um, it has been out there for at least a week or so, so it's nothing that new. Um, are there any, do people want to talk about these two at all, even though Clemens is not on the call? Okay, not hearing it. Um, so let's see, I don't believe Alan is on the call, but I did want to bring this one up for people's attention to make sure they look at it, because it's been at the bottom of the list for at least a week or two now. So, Alan Conway, I believe is the gentleman's name. He's trying to add some clarification text to the spec around uniqueness, in particular around, um, or trying to put forward the idea of uh, in combination of the source plus the ID needing to be unique uh, from the producer's perspective. And I know that there have been some comments going back and forth, um, and there's still some open comments on this PR, <clears throat> but I wanted to get a general sense from this group whether using source and the ID together is heading in, headed in the right direction or whether people have some concerns about that. Because I know a couple of people, only a few people make comments on the PR, but I wanted to open it up to the broader audience. So let me just sort of pause there. Does source plus ID sound right in terms of uniqueness or does that raise any concerns for people? What's the scope of the uniqueness we're talking about here? I believe it's scope within the, within the, I'm sorry, it's unique within the scope of the producer's perspective, whatever that means to you. <laughs> um, but as a consumer, I could still see duplicates if somehow two different producers decided to use the same source and event ID. That may technically be possible. I need to go back and double check what you wrote here, but that may technically be possible. Because I think it would be useful for it to be globally unique in some sense. I agree yeah, that does one, uh, Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I think that is what Alan wanted to achieve, to basically force or make the event producer responsible for choosing a unique source. So the event producer, uh, basically it's the an online 241. Um, basically it's the producer's well, the producer must ensure that source and ID is unique for each distinct event. So basically he asked the producer to choose a source that is globally unique. Personally, I think that is, well, impossible, but that is the, uh, the proposal he's doing here. Does that answer your question, Evan? It does answer my question. Um... I think there are ways using either GUIDs or authorities to make sure that it was globally unique, but it sounds like we're not trying to do that. Can you open up a 
com or put add a comment to the issue? I can add a comment, yes. Please do, it's a book on that. <clears throat> okay. Anybody else have a comment on the direction be proposed here? So I, I don't remember if my comment is on this PR or some issue or something, but I, I, for one, do not believe we can practically enforce global uniqueness in um, source specific ID because we don't know who the producers are. There's no global registry for them. There's, it puts burden. If an open source project uses cloud events as their format, they will have to somehow make sure that the source is globally unique if they want to be conformant, if we require it. And that either means that they generate random strings or put the burden on their user to make it globally unique. And I don't think either scenario makes sense. I gave an example uh, along these lines, wherever I put that comment, where you can see more, but that's my thinking here. So are, are you suggesting that we basically don't, don't do this PR at all and leave it as it is? Well, I suggest that we can clarify, it, but we don't require globally unique source to seven ID combinations. And if, and in terms of clarifying it, what kind of direction would you like us to head? Great question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have, we would have to ask someone who has um, confusion about the uniqueness because to me it wasn't confusing at any point. It's producer defined. If, if, if you have a deployment of an open source project creating cloud events, it's on you to make sure that your events are unique in the source plus events ID or source plus ID combination in your context. It's, I do not believe that if, if a cloud provider has a thousand deployments using that same open source project, it would not be make more sense for them to prepare the customer or workspace or something ID before the source and event ID before thinking that they are unique. They, there's no way they could actually rely on our spec saying that the events are globally unique in source plus, plus ID. It's just not practically possible without some kind of global registry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Neil, did you want to say something? Neil, I've noticed you came off mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Yeah, um, I guess my point was, you know, this is a problem that's we've been, you know, hit again and again and again, and there's lo lots of different ways of solving this. And in the context of cloud, you've normally got some kind of security context and the security context is something that you um, do have some kind of awareness over and you do have, a, you know, an operational model for defining things within your context that are potentially, that should be globally unique to you relative to, to everyone else. If those higher level security contexts are also unique amongst themselves then you naturally inherit a globally unique behavior. But at the same time, I don't think this spec is far enough along to, to make any kind of grand claims um, about that because until we get to security and context and things like that, then I think what we've got for now is something that could evolve naturally and I, I think this problem will naturally be solved. So it sounds like you're sort of in the same camp as uh, Tapini then? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anybody else want to? Well, I guess my point is we're never going to have a flat hierarchy globally. That's just unmanageable. But there's always going to be some kind of hierarchical context within which everyone is going to operate in order just to make things scale. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak up? I agree with what has been said, and I tried to write that as comments. I think there is still a need to clarify it, but I guess, I think one thing we can do is really specify and say that a consumer is allowed to ignore events that have both source and ID and maybe event type, but source and ID maybe is fine. So they're 
allowed to use that for uh, duplication, uh, deduplication. So that as a clarification is good. And then maybe in the primer say, what well, also what you wrote down, hey, if you build a larger application, you basically it's on you to make sure that the sources don't clash. But the language used here in the spec is too harsh, I think, because as the other said, it's not enforceable. That's an interesting approach. What do other people think about that? And, and let me rephrase it to make sure I understood what you're saying there. <clears throat> Don't necessarily add text to clarify or to, to be as prescriptive about the values of these fields, but rather focus on the receiver being able to do some dedupe logic based upon source ID type or something like that. And then leave it at that basically. Is that what you're basically implying? Yeah. So it is <clears throat> the you can do deduplication on this field. That's okay to do. You're still a wallet con, uh, consumer of events if you deduplicate two events based on these, but they were actually two different events. That is not your sort of fault, but at the same time, it's not the event producer, the code that has that must ensure it. Basically, that's an unfortunate circumstance in overall of your application and neither the code of the producer nor the code of the consumer is at fault. It's the fault of how the overall uh, application has been set up. And so if you set up the application, don't do that, basically. Anybody want to comment on the proposal put out there? Sometimes you guys are too quiet. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so I think that sounds sounds good, except that it is actually in, in a single deployment of a producer, or actually one producer, however you want to define that, is they are unique in, in the context of the producer. So when you say that the producer doesn't need to care about it, it actually does according to the spec now. The, the, the problem comes when you have multiple producers or multiple deployments of the same producer, let's say. And that's where if, if you com combine events from two deployments or two different contexts, that's when you can have problems with the duping on the ID. And I think explaining it like that would be great, but just to clarify. Yes. So, so Christoph, did you, did you or did you not put a, uh, a comment in there proposing that in the, in the PR? I can't remember. Uh, I didn't put it. I come to that extent. I can do that. Okay, that might be good to do just to get that thought process out there for people to think about it. Um, from from my perspective, I, um, since no one else is jumping up, I, I often tend to wonder about things like this, whether these things, I think as both some people have already said, whether these things kind of solve themselves, right? Uh, for example, if you if you are a quote, real event producer, if you know that people are going to use, for example, source plus ID as some sort of deduping thing, you'd be pretty stupid to produce non-unique values for those. And you'd be pretty stupid to use that producer if it's going to cause problems because they don't do that. Um, so that's why I, I tend to sometimes think that you don't need specs to be too prescriptive here because people will just do the right thing anyway. And by being too, prescript, too prescriptive, we actually may limit the usage of the spec because there may be some situations where a person either can't or just doesn't want to be that unique about these things and they're perfectly okay with that. Um, so I, that, that's where I might head tends to land on these things. Whereas a lot of times I think things, these things sort of just solve themselves out of just necessity. Anyway, <clears throat> okay, anybody else want to raise a comment on here? Otherwise we're going to continue the discussion back in the PR itself. All right, moving forward then. That's it for the PRs. What I want to do now is quickly talk about some of the security issues. Um, so I think one of the big milestones or one of the big items we have in this milestone is to address all known security issues. Um, I believe that a fair number of them fall into the same category as this one that we have highlighted here, which is doing things like encrypting the data, um, determining things like event confidentiality and stuff like that. So far, most of those have either gone uncommented or someone like Clemens speaks up and says, don't go there, it's scary. <laughs> um, 
and we end up saying uh, we're going to deal with it after 1.0 or we'll deal with it as a follow-on spec that they're on top of a cloud event or something like that. But when I guess what, I, my, what I'm getting to here is I wanted to know whether you guys on the call are okay with that general direction because I believe at least two of the PRs or issues out there have had Clemens comment on it basically saying, let's not go there. And I haven't heard any pushback from that. Um, but I wanted to get us, I want to bring it up here to one for you guys to look at those issues, but two, give you opportunity to, to voice your opinion on this call. Because I'm going to assume at, at this point that silence means no one's really that interested in addressing it. And I don't want to make the incorrect assumption. Anybody want to speak up on these things? Yeah. I, I was going to say, I think it's something we need to have an opinion on or guidance on. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll have a look at those. Okay. Please do. I, I guess I, I might have misspoke a little there. Um, I think at least in one of the comments, Clemens did say uh, potentially add something to the primer, or maybe it was me who was suggesting it. I, I do think we need something in the primer to explain why we're doing nothing if that is the choice we do make, just so people know what we thought about it. Um, I think particularly the immutability of event context, um, having some guidance indicating if it's mutable, you know, something like, like what you commented about best practices or what you should and shouldn't change. Mm -hmm. um, or if you change X, also change Y um, might be useful. Okay. Can you do me a favor and add a comment to that effect yeah. in that particular issue? Thank you very much. That, that will at least get the ball rolling because given the way things have worked in this group so far, what ends up happening is someone puts an idea out there and then someone thank God, volunteers and says, okay, I'll take a stab at what people have mentioned out there. So if you can at least get the ideas out there, someone else can take the ball and put it together a PR, even if it is just additional comments on the primer, assuming you don't have time to do it yourself, Evan. Um, if you want to, that'd be great though. I will at least put a comment there. Thank you very much. All right, anybody else want to comment on the general topic around security? Okay. Um, can't remember why I thought this one was interesting. Hold on a minute. Oh, Evan, this was yours. Do you want to talk to this one? For some reason, this one jumped out at me as something we, we should be talking about. Life making more why. Oh, um, I spent, I don't know, nine months or so in security. And so whenever I read a spec, I start to think of all the interesting things you can do. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, you know, looked at some of the interesting things that you could put in our different fields. And it seemed like some of these are unexpected. Um, and we should either have a test suite that tests that the unexpected things go through or tighten up the types so that you don't get surprises. Um, as a couple of examples, um, quotes in a smiley face, I think, um, is allowed as a ID that seems a little bit, you know, that seems like something that might throw off some JSON parsers or some libraries. Um, I think type is actually allowed to contain Unicode. So, um, you could actually have a event type that is, you know, a smiley face or a wink or something like that. And again, that seems like something that people might be thrown off by actually seeing on the wire. Interesting. So what do people think about that? Come on guys. Okay, so from my perspective, I, I thought it was useful mainly because <clears throat> this could expose, as you're basically saying, you know, problems in the spec from an interoperability perspective. Um, I think the last thing we want to get into is a, a fight between two people where the producer says, hey, I'm producing valid spec compliant stuff and the receiver gets this smiley face in there and it's completely unexpected. And everybody else says, no, 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 that's just too weird. We shouldn't allow that. So I was thinking the spec might need to be a little bit more precise on these things as you're suggesting there, Evan. Um, but in terms of next steps, is it a matter of 
<clears throat> just looking at each property to figure out what rules we may want to put in place? Or is it more of a TCK kind of thing that we need to create as you were suggesting? I'm happy to create a set of TCK cases. And if people say, no, those are ridiculous, then we go back and we tighten up the spec. Okay. That sounds like a good, good thing to me. Anybody else want to jump in here? Okay. Yeah. If you could, if you could do that, Evan, um, that'd be, that'd be great. I'd appreciate that. All right. Anybody else want to comment on that one before I move on? Okay. We have only a couple minutes left. Um, these ones aren't technically ready. However, since Neil, you're on the call, is there anything you want to say about 218? <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, it's probably the longest PR I think I've seen. Sorry, I accidentally hit mute. I think it's probably the longest PR I've seen um, for some time. Um, for me, my background is in events and streaming. And so when I think about events, I think about them in the context of a stream. And that stream is defined by the key. Um, and that's basically, this all goes back to data modeling as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I guess that's the lens that I see this through um, because I work for Confluent and you know, we're the company that effectively are behind Kafka. So it's hard for me to see how it could be the responsibility of the consumer to determine what the stream key is when you think about a relational table, when you do your data modeling, you define what the key is for that row. Um, and that for me is like exactly what this scenario is doing. It's, it's largely a data modeling exercise. Yeah. And so the reason I wanted to bring this one up here, aside from Neil being on the call, is because Neil, that, that one sentence that I've highlighted in there, I thought was probably the key one for me reading the latest yep. set of comments. And I, I wanted to get a sense from the other people on the call. When it comes to uh, a receiver being able to put events into particular buckets, um, the way I guess Kafka does, who typically defines what bucket it goes into? Is it the receiver, as Clement is basically suggesting, or does the producer give a hint through some sort of key? My, my stab would be the producer is the one that knows how to logically associate stuff to bucket them. That would be my off-the-cuff comment. Okay, thank you, Clem. I did that, Clem. <laughs> Jim? I'll go with Clem, it's okay. <laughs> okay, anybody else want to speak up from their experience? Um, this is Vladimir. Yes, I agree with Jim. It is the producer that would define where the things go. Okay. Oh, okay, here, here, here's somebody. Um, okay. So, yes, it's a producer. <laughs> that defines the key, but it's not necessarily this events producer that defines the key because it can go through multiple middleware before reaching its eventual consumer. It's the original producer has no way of knowing how some intermediary might want to partition or split the events. And that's the point that Clemens is making, not that it's the consumer's responsibility, but that it's the responsibility of the part or the the um, whatever is putting it into Kafka, for example, it's their responsibility to uh, set the key here. And if it's the semantic key, as you're talking about event modeling, that's the source. We already have a field for that. That's it's the not necessarily the source because it might be a transaction ID coming from the same source. It might be a series of related events that define the stream that can come from the same source. Oh, sure. M multi-level. If, 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 if you want to go multi-level there, that's fine. But yeah, that the, the, one of the comments on this is proposing that we pull it out of the data payload. I don't think that's very secure, providing anyone access to the data payload unless they have the correct credentials. The other aspect on top of that is allowing partitions and topics to be created. That's something that's 
done at design time. You can't just go and say, I'm going to create a topic with two partitions or 5,000 partitions or even 200,000 partitions because they all are all very workload and use case specific. It's not something that you can automate. Like a database table, you define it, you model it, you shape it for the workload characteristics. It can never be done in an automated way because the implications of that are massive. Sure, sure. But it's not about creating the topics. It's Let's say there's a producer, A, that creates the event. It goes through cloud A to cloud B, where there's another producing component that gets the, that access both the consumer and producer. It takes the event and wants to put it forward, but split in a different way, partitioned in a different way. Now, you're saying that we would have to create a new event, basically, that has the event key set differently instead of just passing on the event, but partitioned differently. So, so hold on a sec. I was out of time. Let me just get Clems. I'm not Clem, Jeez, Jim, since he raised his hand. So go ahead, Jim. I, this I may have to be the last comment. It's running out of time. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, uh, I think I'm echoing what Neil was saying. Um, and maybe I should clarify my first comment. It's the person that puts it on the wire who gets to decide how to partition it. Yeah. Um, the original producer will do that at the time he originally sends it. And then some intermediary will do that at each hop along the way. And, and who knows, or, you know, dare I say, who cares how they decide to do that? I don't, I, I, I'm struggling now to understand how we got into this position in the first place and why, why this needed to be um, uh, drawn out as some sort of spec item. So, so Jim, can you do me a favor and add a comment to the to the PR? To that effect, uh, uh, sure. Can I can okay. I just add can I have one final comment? Yeah, absolutely. Please go ahead. I I'd, I'd prefer to go with the simplest solution. Um, I'm not in favor of introspection or adding adding more administration overhead. I mean, if this spec can evolve, which is what it should do through our learnings, then the simplest thing for now would be to put it in as an extension. And if we then do discover that it just doesn't work, then we've learned and we can make a decision based upon that. Because at the moment, there's a lot of different lenses that people are viewing this problem through. Um, if we can do something that's simple, that people understand, and it is an extension over the basic spec, then we know because it's simple, it is going to work. Right. So it's not so going to block them. people from adopting this uh, cloud event. Because we, we see a lot of our customers wanting to use cloud events but at the same time, I'm like saying, well, let's just see how this evolves because before we can use this properly within Kafka, we have a few kind of things that we need to figure out. Right, and I know IBM actually wants to get the Kafka binding done too, so we're anxious as well. So let me take this, let me take this action item to go off and talk to Clemens, hopefully tomorrow offline, and see what his objection is to making it a Kafka transport binding specific extension for right now to at least get us <clears throat> over the current bump in the road. Okay, because I think he was still pushing back on that. So I'll take that actually, I have to talk to him and see if I can better understand it. Um, all right, uh, roll call, I apologize, we're, we're way late, I apologize. So Jim, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, Christian, you there? Right here, hello. Okay, uh, Matthias? Uh, let's see Matthias on the slide. Uh, Erwin? No, Evan, I got you. Anybody else I missed for roll call? Joe Sherman, did you get me? Uh, yes, thank you, Joe. Good, thanks. Okay, anybody else? Victor Matos is here. I'm sorry, who's that? Victor. Victor. Victor, got it. Okay. Anybody else? All right, thank you guys very much. And I believe actually right now we're supposed to be having a phone call on something. What were you having a phone call on? Uh, KubeCon EU deep dive. There you go, KubeCon planning. So if you're not interested in that, you may drop. Thank you guys for joining. And I apologize for running over. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Next week. Thank you. Bye. <clears throat> yes, Scott. Hours and hours of Zoom. You can't escape it. <laughs> I'm gonna step away for a minute. I'll be right back. Okay. So let's see. So Scott will be back. Find you're here. Mr. Barker, you're there. First off. Richard. 
Joe, are you actually sticking around or are you just? No, I'm <laughs> slow in getting on. <laughs> okay. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm missing somebody. Who am I missing? Oh, Doug. M. All right. <clears throat> yeah, I have a doc for this. I can't remember. Hold on a minute. Do, 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 do. I think I did. There it is. So, um, okay, so this is the current layout that we have. Actually, I apologize. Um, Bern, you, you wanted to bring up a topic. Did you want to mention this one right now? Yeah, why not? Okay. I'm, I'm new to the call, so I'm not sure about your uh, like protocol. Um, now, the thing is that, um, okay, we are an open source uh, workflow automation vendor, so I'm quite active in the workflow automation space. And I'm currently giving a lot of talks, talking about orchestration, choreography, event-driven things. And um, what's currently coming up quite often is that, um, even in serverless worlds, but also like in the whole cloud native space, a lot of people are, uh, yeah, missing kind of workflow functionalities. All the cloud vendors are building something like uh, AWS Step Functions or Azure Durable Functions or Google Cloud Composer and all these kind of tools. Um, but they're not represented at all in the in the um, cloud native landscape. And when I discussed that, like at the serverless days Hamburg, Christoph approached me and said, hey, um, probably for KubeCon, the, there's an opportunity to work on the, on the landscape anyway. And that might be also an opportunity to include that category um, in the landscape. And that's what I wanted to bring up in the call actually and to discuss. Yep. So we do have a topic on the agenda for the, the bigger serverless working group um, where I believe Scott and Dan were gonna take the lead on seeing what we needed to update on the serverless docs. And that does include the landscape. So I think yep. that would definitely fit into there obviously very nicely. Okay. Um, I have, what I'd like to do is put your name there. I don't know if I can spell it right. Almost. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is just assume it's going to get covered under that particular topic and that you three will figure out how you want to move forward there. Um, what I, I, I don't think, you correct me, Dan or Scott, if, if you're back, Scott, whether I'm wrong here or not, but I don't think you guys have actually started that work yet. Is that, is that true, Scott and Dan? That's correct from my side. Yeah, sorry. Okay. That's fine. So I, what I was thinking, Bern, since this is obviously a topic that you care strongly about, maybe it'd be worthwhile for you to take a look at the, at the serverless uh, doc that they put together and figure out what types of changes you'd like to see in there, or even go as far as to write an additional section if you think that'd be worthwhile, or, or you know, what, what sort of editorial changes you'd like to see, basically. To take to take yeah. the pen and almost, and almost run Is with there, it. Can you, can you give me a good point or like where to start? So with what what, what exact artifact is that on like yeah. GitHub? Or? Hold on. Uh, do, 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 do. NCF, serverless. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's our white paper. Yeah. I'll put that into here. Hold on. Here. And then we have, so here's the white paper itself. Um, now, hold on a minute. Where was the landscape? Did that get moved? Oh, there it is. So, so there's this. Um, there's that. Now, are those the two documents that you were thinking about modifying? 
there, yeah, and to understand the scope currently. So in this call, we're just covering that serverless landscape, right? Not the like the whole cloud native landscape, which is cool. a different matter. Correct. Yeah, this is just serverless, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and the the, the um, oops. Turn it. My machine is just flipping out on here. The white paper as of right now is just a markdown document. Holy moly. It's just a series of markdown documents um, that eventually get pulled together to be in a PDF file. So I think if you were to just open up a pull request or whatever on this MD file right here, I think that will eventually make it into the real thing. Okay, I will have a look at it, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Um, all right. So then going back to the bigger issue or bigger topic, <clears throat> we have this general layout here. Have you guys given any thought to this? Are you guys still okay with the general layout here? Um, otherwise, I think the next steps might be just uh, put together some outline, you know, PowerPoint slides kind of a thing. How do you guys want to move forward on here? Honestly, I haven't worked on my uh, <laughs> deployment pipeline. I honestly expected to start working on it a couple of weeks ago. I haven't had the time, but I don't think it'll take me more than one or two weeks. Okay. Uh, and I do have some design docs for it. So I might be able to share those. Now, am I correct in assuming that, uh, so, we're, so we're talking about this section right here, right? Yeah. Okay, now am I correct in assuming that you'll have a little bit of a presentation as well as like running code to go along with it, right? Is that, is that true? Yeah, the base thing of it is EKS now supports deployments using Lambda because uh, to have access to an EKS cluster, you can use an AWS IAM role. And I'm doing a proof of concept. I did a proof of concept with Lambda that deploys using that IAM role. The thing is, to do a deployment, you do need uh, to uh, transmit like what app you'd like to deploy, what version, what uh, options, and stuff like that. And that's where uh, cloud events comes in. I don't know what code I could run though. Okay, Maybe. So like, I, I will definitely jump through the code and showcase how cloud events are used. Okay, so maybe so. So, so you're thinking this is more just a presentation and not running code. Uh, code would be run, but not written live. Oh no, no, no. Or modified. <laughs> but no, we'll I'll run it. Yeah. We'll okay. Funny deploy or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Nope. Okay. Okay. So, so to tell you what, um, since it sounds like you guys haven't done a whole lot yet relative to actually putting together stuff for the presentations, um. Why don't I reach out to Chris and a check just to see if we can get the, the template that they want us to use for this stuff. And if, if that's available, um, I'll just create some, some you know, placeholder files. And then as you guys get time, you can start adding more to it. Um, at least that way, it, it feels like we're at least making some sort of forward progress. And that way you feel like there's a document out there you can make slow in incremental progress one slide at a time. Um, hey, hey, Doug, is there a serverless working group email uh, list? Yes, there is. Because I, I assume that the, the subgroup that started cloud events is not the original serverless working group group. No, it is. They are, def they are technically separate groups with separate mailing lists. It's just it's the same group of people as of right now. All right. So maybe we should also engage that group and say we're, we're going to try to update the doc. And maybe those individuals are also interested in participating. We can do that if I can find the darn mailing list. I know it's out there somewhere. I'll find that. Okay. So I'll tell you what, let me do this. Uh, where's my cursor? I'll take the AI for that. Um, see. And they're talking about just uh, further updates of the docs or were you thinking about getting their input on everything? 
Yeah, it looks like there was 26 people that contributed to the white paper and mm -hmm. potentially those people are also interested in updating it. Okay. That, that was my thought. Okay, that's fine. I just want to make sure I got it. Okay, I can do that. All right. Um, in that case, is there anything else you guys want to talk about on this topic? Otherwise, we're going to end early. Uh, okay. I just want a little bit of clarification on these, the, well, basically the, the uh, third thing, the serverless workgroup session. Mm -hmm. So my name is under, uh, but as of now, it's kind of unclear to me what the serverless summit is exactly going to be and if it will make sense to put the stuff I want to talk about like as part of the serverless work group or if that would rather be a separate talk or how, how that would be handled best. Yeah, I, I don't know to be honest because I don't yet understand the serverless summit uh, in terms of their structure and topics because my initial reaction was that it's a direct overlap or at least some of it will be direct overlap to what we want to do here. Um, what I'd almost rather do is see if we can get Chris Anacek to agree that maybe what we should do is take this session and turn it into a session at the serverless summit. Um, but I guess, well, so, okay, so I guess that doesn't really answer your question about whether you should talk about your stuff under here, regardless of where it's, where, which summit it's in, or whether you should do your own CFP for the serverless summit, right? Well, is the serverless summit a CNCF thing? Yes, I believe so. Is it the same time period as KubeCon EU? It's going to be... I think it's the Monday before and then KubeCon starts on Tuesday or something. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so it's right before it. Yeah, I think it is made the, the Monday before it. So... I mean, what I, what I can also, like the thing I would talk about, I could also make a pull request on the white paper and then maybe we can have a session where multi -pe multiple people talk about what has changed on the landscape. And yeah, and then I would have one part there. So everybody talks a bit about what they have contributed, basically. That would be one idea. Then it's sort of clear that it comes out of the service work group if that is what we want to do. On the other hand, we could also make like, hey, that speaker happens to be part of the serverless work group, but it's not really relevant. He's just giving a talk. So I'm sorry, I, I think I need food. <laughs> I want to make sure I understand what you're saying there. So these are the two topics that you were talking about, right? Well, uh, I think what I want to talk about is uh, there are vendors that bring out their own function as a service uh, to use with their service. So for example, well, PayPal Braintree will use the function as a service, of Zero has their own function as a service, Twilio has their own, uh, Adobe has their own and so on. So we have basically function as a service providers who are not a general purpose cloud, but are really specific to be used with another service. Uh, so that is, very interesting because we haven't had that before sort of in computing in that your code is then really distributed across cloud vendors and then you run into a lot of fun things that maybe no one has fought through so is that, that is what i would talk about is that is that something that that you think that the serverless working group should take action on Personally, I do, um, because I think it, it will end up, if you don't have a standard and it, or anything, basically I, I use five services and each service comes with their own function as a service. I have to have, I have five different interfaces of what is a function, how do I deploy it, how do I get metrics or logs out of there. Um, so it, it basically becomes a mess. I guess I, I haven't 
been in that situation, but it's what I imagine it to be. Versus okay. if there would be clear standards around what it is, or if everybody would agree to run, I don't know, K-native, <laughs> let's say that everybody would agree on K-native, then it would be, I could deploy it on each cloud vendor individually, but I have a standardized interface to do so. And when you think about talking about this, how long do you think your talk would be? That can depend. I mean, um, I can do like live demos and, and talk in details about all these products, then I can stretch it out. Uh, but I guess at minimum, I need, uh, I could also do like a lightning talk where I talk here's really quickly, here's what they're doing, a few examples, and then talk about the problems I see, and then I'm done in like 10 minutes or so. Okay. Well, the reason I was asking for how long it, the talk it is is because <clears throat> the first thing that runs through my mind is that this sounds like it's a big enough topic to warrant its own session at the serverless summit. However, because you, you seem to think that it would directly impact the serverless working group in terms of what we look at in terms of possible standardization going forward. Um, I, what I was wondering was whether, aside from the session at the serverless summit, is whether you could condense it down into like a very brief five minute, like you said, lightning talk for the, for the serverless working group as a way to jumpstart the conversation with the community to, to say, do you guys agree with, with, with Christoph that these are some areas where we should look at possible standardization? And then you could you know, use the five minutes to talk very quickly about the use cases or the scenarios that you've run into. Does, does any of that make sense? That does make sense, yes. Okay. So, because so, I do think it's a very interesting topic and I wouldn't want you to, to not submit it to the serverless summit because I do think it sounds like a, one that's worthy enough you know, to get its own time slot basically. Um, but I do, I do want to use the information in our birds of a feather session or with the interaction with the community. So I'd almost want to do both. Okay. That would also make sense. Okay. Um, okay. Um, anything else you guys want to bring up here? Okay. I'm going to assume then that the lack of discussion is just because everybody's busy with everything else and that will ramp up as we get closer to the event because it's still a couple months out. Um, in terms of next steps though, I know, Bern, you're gonna look at making a PR, and actually, Christoph, you mentioned possibly making a PR to the white, that white paper as well. Obviously, that'd be very welcome. Um, but in terms of next steps, do you guys want me to schedule another call now for, you know, a, a well-known time, or do you want to wait until we get closer and then when panic sets in, we'll set up a call. How do you guys want to work this? I think setting a call for like in one or two weeks would be good, just as a reminder for me to shame myself that I still haven't started. <laughs> I, I like the way you think, because I'm the same way. I, <laughs> I, need, yeah, I need forcing me functions. Too. Me too, but I would probably go for two weeks, not for next week. Yeah, I was thinking two weeks as well. Okay. So, uh, okay. So, what do you guys think? I'll, I'll set up a call for two weeks. I guess I assume after the regular phone call is good for everybody, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Hold on a minute. Uh, make, make a note of myself. Forget it. Uh, okay. Cool. All right. Anything else you guys want to talk about? All right, in that case, we are done. Yes, Scott, panic. <laughs> All right, in that case, we are done. Thank you guys very much, and we'll talk next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, hey, guys. Bye-bye. Oh, Baron? Baron? No, okay, he's gone. All right.